My name is Fritz Klasner. I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager with the Office of Mauna Kea Management, and this is the monthly Mauna Kea Speaker Series. Uh, the Mauna Kea Speaker Series is a partnership between the Office of Mauna Kea Management, University of Hawaii at Hilo Physics and Astronomy Department, and the Imi Loa Astronomy Center here on, also here on campus. We're pleased to introduce Dr. Jesse Ivan. Um, Jesse, amongst many other things, is the world expert on the Makey Bug. Uh, sure. which she'll talk about is the insect that's endemic to the summit of Mauna Kea. But um, Jesse got his PhD working on the vacu bug and that wrapped up in 2012? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and all, the, all the work was done about 2011. Yeah. Okay. Yep. He's completing his PhD on Mauna Kea work. He's been teaching here at UH Hilo uh, in the College of Agriculture and uh, Forestry. Forestry and Natural Resource Forestry Management. Forestry and Natural Resource yeah. Management. Um, and still working on Mauna Kea related issues, arthropod biodiversity. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to let him talk about what arthropods are and biodiversity is in Mauna Kea. So, All right. Thank you. Thanks, Fritz, and welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about insects, but you know, to be a little bit funny, what's up on Mauna Kea? Uh, there are lots of insects up on the top. There are lots of other aspects of Mauna Kea that this lecture series is about. So I think the best thing, if, for those of you who have probably attended a couple of other talks, is to think of how all of these are connected and related, because that is what our world is. It is connected and related. Um, of course, I don't do this myself. My students do a majority of the work. Um, this was all started with Dan Rubinoff at UH Manoa, who was my uh, uh, graduate advisor when I did my PhD, and we still have collaborative grants and projects um, still on Mauna Kea. Um, as basically the two people have probably dabbled the most in kind of the really um, detailed research work on Mauna Kea through students and projects. Um, but lab members, we have a lot of them. Um, here in bold are the three master's students that have all gotten their master's degrees related to insects on Mauna Kea. Um, they all graduated this year or before. And then of course, Marlena, I'll talk to, about her quite a bit. This is Marlena, she's my head taxonomist right now, a linguistics major, graduated from uh, here at UH Hilo, but I uh, met her through 4-H. I bought chickens from her. Like this is our community. These are the people that we're connected to and it really is the people that matter, especially me as a professor, to educate the next generation to hopefully do the things that I enjoy to do and hopefully I'm good at. Um, so that's really the point of this is to train the next generation so that we actually have people that can give this knowledge out more broadly than just a couple of lectures here or there and really get the information to everyone. So this is usually what the lab looks like when we have all of the insects out trying to identify everything um, in the cramped little lab in the College of Ag, and then we take over the teaching classroom basically during the holidays. So if you come by through the holidays, we'll probably be doing this. Um, funding and support. Uh, majority of the funding has actually come from Office of Mauna Kea Management as kind of internal research funds to support research students and the management of the mountain. Um, as well as 30 meter telescope, International Observatory. Those were some projects for invasive species. Um, we are part of the taxonomy for um, Big on Invasive Species Committee does surveys, but we do the taxonomy to confirm what they find and voucher them in our UH Hilo collection. It's now one of the uh, fourth large, it's the fourth largest insect collection in the state and one of only three that are legally allowed to have endemic um, invertebrates housed in a museum. Um, it's, it's small, but it is important. There isn't another one on Big Island. Um, and then, of course, support from the College of Ag. Um, we, we have what we have, and I get to use it. So we take over the classrooms. We do work there, and it's, uh, to have the support of the college for this kind of complex, long-term project is really important. Um, partners, BISC, as I mentioned before, Big Island Invasive Species Committee. Um, Jordan, he's the student who graduated. He works for them now. Um, but to get people with this training into the places that need uh, insect training and knowledge, that's the whole point, to make sure that we have those resources here. Um, also, DOFA, DLNR, and the NARS system, Natural Area Reserve System, a lot of these lands um, are across uh, landholders, um, University of Hawaii, but also all the partner lands, also DHHL, um, that we've had to work in through many years to try to figure out where these insects are and where they come from. All right, basics. Here's your entomology lesson. Um, Hawaii is really weird. We're out in the middle of the ocean. We all know this. But that means that creatures that come here have to get there here under their own power or the power of the currents or winds. Um, our islands came up out of the ocean. 
So if you think of it overall, and there's approximate marks of all these, not because we don't know what we have, it's just the taxonomy has changed through the past couple of years. There are currently, I think, 30 orders because, did you know termites are cockroaches? Ta-da, there are no more termites as a group. They're roaches, they're really special roaches. Um, so that's why the numbers of all of these classifications have changed. Um, here in Hawaii, of all of the species we have, about 10,000 native insects um, that are native and endemic to the Hawaiian Islands, those are from only about 250 to max about 400 individual colony founding members that arrived and then diversified. So that's about one successful entry into Hawaiian establishment and then diversity increase every 100,000 years or so over the course of the main Hawaiian Islands, like five and a half million years. And then, of course, lots of introduced species. We know that pests are introduced. We also know that biological control species have been introduced. There are lots of introduced taxa, either on purpose or accidentally. Um, the current average is about nine to 20 new species of insects every year. And we never know where they're gonna come from, how they arrive, although there's actually been a really good study that says they arrive on commodities, not on actual agricultural consumer consumables, basically on shipping pallets and tiles, building supplies. That's where our invasive species come from, largely. Um, those kinds of things, we need to figure out what they're going to do in Hawaii. And you never really know that unless you know enough about what it is, where it came from, to figure it out. That's a really challenging process. Having insect education in Hawaii is more difficult than anywhere else, at least in the United States, um, perhaps the world, because you can't be a specialized person in a local environment if you want to know what you're doing because you have to see something new that you've never encountered before and figure out that it's something new and then figure out where to go from there so there's always going to be something different and new and you have to be able to react to that um, here are some of our great endemics uh, these are some examples of kind of wet forest tax and then some high elevation but we have some really special endemic spiders everybody see our Orb-weaving spider here in camouflage on the bark of an ohia tree. Uh, it doesn't spin giant orb webs here in Hawaii. It's a camouflage predator, whereas it's not like that anywhere else on Earth in that group, in the Ascona. We've got mirrored plant bugs that have, um, only consume one type of plant. We've got Drosophila flies and the most endangered species and the most species in this group of anywhere on Earth. Um, who has ever heard of a fruit fly that gets into your rotting food or whatever? That's now been confirmed that Hawaii is not a dead end of evolution. That was actually an original taxa that evolved in Hawaii, then went everywhere else a couple million years ago, and then diversified, became a Drosophila melanogaster and a little pest fly, and then came back. Um, Hawaii is not a dead end. That's, that's a really important thing to remember. We are part of the world. It's rare that things evolve here and then get somewhere else and then evolve and then come back, but it happens. Uh, this is a leaf hopper. Um, if you've ever seen an ohia tree with the little pimples on the leaves, that is the insect that makes the gall. There are five to 20 different species, depending on what you're looking at, but these make the gall and they're endemic to Hawaii. They don't kill the tree. They've co-evolved with ohia trees and similar trees over 5 million years. They don't kill them. They just work together. Have you ever heard of the Carnivorous caterpillar here in Hawaii, Eupithecia, a geometric inchworm, like walks like a typical inchworm, but it has giant raptorial legs and it catches the Drosophila melanogaster. That's the introduced Drosophila fly. Eats them all day long. The carnivorous caterpillar, pretty common in volcano. Uh, think of the connections between endemic taxa and introduced species. So the coconut rhinoceros beetle, about the size of the palm of your hand, introduced on Oahu. If you've ever seen the large black traps around the airport, they're monitoring traps around all ports on all islands because they're only on Oahu so far. Um, they will attack and kill palm trees of any type. This is our endemic um, Prochardia, so an endemic uh, palm that's quite rare. There, are some, uh, there might be some endangered of that, but on that tree is a threatened species of Drosophila fly that only feeds as larvae on rotting palm fronds of only this genus. So if you have a coconut rhino beetle that arrives here, kills our native palms, you also are gonna kill the fly. Those are the connections that we see. And then we're gonna lose those 
paths to speciation because this group was many million years ago, the group that evolved here went somewhere else, took over other places, and then came back. This nowhere is a dead end. Why are insects important? Heck, there's lots of them. Um, this is terrestrial life here in the Hawaiian Islands. About 70% are insects. Here's fish and birds for vertebrates, freshwater. Um, but basically, insects as a group are the majority of life. It's true everywhere. Um, we're not talking about the single cell guys, that's different. But of the multicellular life, insects are the most diverse. They have all those connections with the environment. They really function as trophic mediators, energy levels of nutrient transfer from primary producers of plants, detritivores, rotting things, eating them, getting eaten. They're the linchpins holding a lot of these connections together. So when those change, your ecosystem changes. So getting into the real details here from Mauna Kea, um, baseline invertebrate surveys and monitoring are really important to try to keep track of what we have and what we've lost. Who has seen the articles over the past couple of weeks of the insect apocalypse? Did you see this in the news? 75% of the biomass of flying insects in Puerto Rico, like after the hurricane, they did a pre and a post survey. I know the guy that did it. It's a good, it's a good job. Um, there's not many insects around anymore. What does that mean? They can't react quickly to climate change. Huge storm events, the forest is destroyed, there's not enough remnant diversity for them to come back every time. What is that gonna mean for us? It's gonna mean, what, we only have cockroaches? The great homogenization of all life on Earth? Do, are we gonna miss our species that we lose? Do we even know what we've lost? So that's what we need to figure out. Insects, because they're really fast growers, have lots of reproduction, can fly, get to new places, these can be an indicator of every ecosystem change if you know what you're looking at. The issue is, is this just noise in the data? Like, what, what does that really mean? Or is it a signal? And that's what we need to try to figure out. So on Mauna Kea, um, State of Hawaii, Natural Area Reserve, Mauna Kea Forest Reserve, these are all areas that have the alpine taxa that we're trying to figure out where they are, what they do, how many there are, and whether or not they're rare. I hope you all know where Mauna Kea is. There it is. Um, this is a, a snow-capped time from the side of a plane. Um, yeah, it snows up there. There's not snow up there currently, but it might snow, it sounds like, maybe this week. Um, the Office of Mauna Kea Management has been doing um, uh, surveys for invasive taxa and other fine sites throughout the entire management area for a long time. But what was established kind of in the rules in the management plan was to get some kind of conservation strategy to figure out what is there, how we can assess it to hopefully protect it. Um, so part of that work was um, talking to me because I worked up there a lot and talking to other entomologists and botany people. Like a lot of this you'll see was from our speaker from last month, Grant Garish. I worked a lot of his, his data as well. So these are the two guiding documents that have kind of worked with a lot of the work that I have kind of tried to help get more definitive answers for, at least the better baseline, um, the comprehensive management plan and then the invasive species management plan, which was from 2015. These are some of the documents that help us to figure out what insects are and what they do and how to assess it. This is the subalpine shrubland and alpine grassland areas at about 9,000 feet, um, right above the visitor station at Haleopahaku. Um, there are plants, there are rocks, um, but it's a fairly open plain, but there's enough plant diversity, if you were at the talk last time, about, I believe, what was it, like 60 some odd plants, um, different species, some endemic, some introduced. And then the Alpine Stone Desert. Um, we're going to be talking about the cinder cones and the glacial till between cinder cones. Mauna Kea was glaciated a few times, the last one about 15,000 years ago, where the glaciers pushed rocks um, from below up to the sides of cinder cones and cut sides of cinder cones off so they're more steep than they actually would have been from just ejecting scoria. If anyone saw our dramatic footage from Leilani Estates, like that, that size and type and slope of cinder cone is a natural slope of falling rocks, whereas you cut the edges off with um, glaciers, it's gonna be more steep 
than what it otherwise would have been through the natural ejection of scoria. So they're, they're, these cinder cones are different. They're steeper than otherwise they would have been. And that's actually an interesting thing for the taxa and the insects that can live there. It's actively eroding. It's always moving. That helps to um, prevent grass or other plant establishment because the ground is always moving because it's still falling down because the slope is more steep than it otherwise would have been. Um, these are really interesting things to think about ecologically for what can grow there. Um, we also know what else is up there, telescopes. Um, I was just up here at the uh, CSO, Caltech uh, Observatory. That's the, one of the first scopes that's gonna be decommissioned. So we were doing a survey for the arthropods around that to see, I mean, from an ecological perspective, putting up a telescope and taking one down is gonna do the same amount of damage to the bugs other than the dirt. <laughs> so we still have to assess what is there to see what that restoration is going to damage or not. You don't know unless you look. The elephant in the room, 30 meter telescope. Um, this telescope, if it goes up, is gonna be out that way. And we did a lot of surveys to see what's out there too. So we'll, we'll look at that data um, to determine what taxa are where and what are the effects from direct impacts and then potential other impacts from changing and bringing in invasive species. So we did uh, work with that with one of my graduate students. Okay, so uh, like I said, really what I do is hopefully train and mentor students so that they know what they're doing so that they can actually do better science than I could do because I teach all the time. Um, Heather Stever in the back. Uh, this is a lot of her information. So she kind of jumped on board with our baseline biodiversity survey, which was one of those original projects that I had with Dan Rubinoff at UH Manoa, but then I got a teaching job. <laughs> so it took a lot of time. So I had to get some help um, and to work here at UH Hilo, the um, graduate program, to bring in students to get trained in the more technical details of this whole process. So she really helped with um, doing some of the advanced science, which we'll see about the endemic insect fauna. Um, and here's some other fauna, the palila bird, which eats insects and seeds, um, to see what pollinators, prey, and decomposers are in this area and what might change. Also looking at um, non-native arthropods that could disrupt uh, the native ecosystem, which is really these, social hymenoptera. Hawaii never had social hymenoptera, ants and bees and wasps. Social insects are amazingly successful because they're social. They have a group of related taxa that can gather nutrients and put all those things in one place for their own use. Sounds familiar for humans, doesn't it? We're pretty successful. We know how to gather nutrients all for our use and put it in one place so we can grow. That's what social hymenoptera do. They're amazingly successful at that. And here in Hawaii, it's been shown time and time again that ants specifically in all different kinds are the creatures that start changing the nutrient cycling from kind of the bottom up, eat everything, eat the seeds, grow fungus, do amazing things, but that's what ants do. And ants are very diverse. Ants as a group are about as old as all of mammals. How many mammals on earth are there? 5,500 species. How many species of ants are there? 22,000 species. And they're the same age. So 65 million years ago. So if you treat a fire ant like you treat an Argentine ant, like you treat a sugar ant, it's like treating a tiger and a mouse and an elephant all the same way. Oh, it's an ant. Just do something with it. No, it's very different. Understanding which tax are aware and what they do is essential to manage these problems. So Jordan Zarders, one of my other students, he graduated this year as well. He did the invasive species survey. So now we have Heather working on the endemic taxa and invasives if we find them, and then someone looking at specifically what invasive taxa are around. Could they move to um, Mauna Kea? And if they do, how can we successfully monitor them in a way to know what those risks are and hopefully mitigate them? Are they coming up on people's food? Are they coming up on tourist cars? Are they coming up on my truck that I take from UH Hilo? Do not take the UH Hilo vans up to Mauna Kea. They go on field trips everywhere. They're not washed regularly. We have to wash everything really well to not move ants around. There are fire ants in every one of your cars if you live in Hilo. Does that matter for Mauna Kea? Probably not because it's, they're a wet species. They need more moisture than is available on Mauna Kea unless they're in a building with a water source. 
Those are the kinds of things you need to think about when you try to manage these issues. Okay, so what is a threat? These are actually defined in Montague Invasive Species Management Plan, and threats are threats in general, not just to ecology. Horn flies and stable flies, they're food for vacu bugs all day long. Here, he's eating a fly. Um, these are wonderful things to have up on Mauna Kea. They're food for the endemic taxa, but they bite people. So they are a threat, because they're a nuisance threat. You have to manage for everything, not just the ecology. So this management plan is a little bit more broad than just what I really like is the bugs. It's what are threats for everything, um, including stinging creatures that might sting a person and you have to get medevac from the top of Mauna Kea. That's gonna be a problem. Um, they're still threats. So ants are the priority threat, wasps number two, spiders, big problem. They eat everything. There's no real ways to manage spiders as a pest other than spraying them with something which we're not gonna do on Mauna Kea. Um, social insects, you can put baits out perhaps, and that could help manage your situation in a way that is vastly more ecologically sound to not do more damage than just spray everything with poison. You can have very targeted ways to remove social creatures. Okay, so this biodiversity assessment was really created from Grant Garrish's plant survey. So if you saw the talk last time or watched it on YouTube, they did amazing work to go throughout this entire region and get maps of all of the plants throughout the entire UH managed areas. We use that as our data source to go catch bugs on all those plants, to connect the insects that are on the plants that, in, that uh, make up the entire ecosystem. So insects are very diverse. They live on different plants, they eat different things, they survive in different ways. So you have to do multiple techniques to try to catch them all. And you have to do it many times. This is what we call a plant beat, which is actually a volumetric measure that you can measure how much of the shrub you get per net. Shake it, suck up all the bugs. So this is from one shaking. This is all Orthotylus sophoricola, the endemic seed or um, plant bug that only feeds on mamane trees. Huge densities, up to 80,000 per tree. That's food for, for birds. Um, they don't kill the trees. But if you get an invasive pseudococcid, I think we had the, uh, earlier, it might kill those trees. But our endemic ones have co-evolved with mamane so that they don't kill each other out. That's what ecology of building species does. So we look for them, we count them, and then we take them back to the lab and put them in boxes. Uh, pitfall traps, they're ground dwelling creatures that are out at night. Sadly, we don't run around at night trying to catch bugs all the time. We've been out there at night a few times, put out light traps, but this is one of the ways to intercept ground dwelling creatures that aren't gonna be up on the plants. We also take leaf litter and hand sort it under a microscope to see what kind of detritivores and small creatures are in there that are um, cycling the nutrients. This is also where ants are gonna be. So this is one of our ways to really have a good check to see if there are non-native ants in an area. And then a great way to get pollinators but a terrible way to identify pollinators is get them stuck on a glue trap. Uh, it looks like a big yellow flower to them, um, but this is a way to determine if we're catching the same taxa that are attracted to plants that we're getting in our little uh, net catchers. So this is um, Hylaeus bees. You've heard of our endemic bees. I'll talk about them later. None of the endangered ones are up there, I promise. We've checked for many years. Um, but this is a way to assess other creatures that are gonna be flying and they're gonna fly away from your net. So they hit that and get stuck. And then specific uh, traps for ants of many different types. Baited uh, pitfall traps, yellow pan traps, hand searches. BISC does and, and continues to do a lot of this work for hands-on. We also do it as part of our annual monitoring that I help OMCAM with. So overall, 83,000 individual insects counted. That's a lot of bugs. The majority of that are super small calembola detritivores in the leaf litter that we estimated by unit of uh, milliliter. So it's mostly microscopic, very small, immature leaf litter eating creatures, um, calembola. Uh, about 20,000 are other taxa that we've counted. Most of them are these very, very small things. So that's when you get into your ideas of how many are there versus how much do they weigh? Biomass versus numbers. Uh, these were all sorted by morpho species or genus and species if we could get there. 
Um, Marlena is our head taxonomist right now. She has helped us immensely um, and just an amazing worker, sits in the scope for six to eight hours a day and counts bugs. Um, incredible job. From this information, we can get uh, data about abundance, diversity, and phenology. Phenology is when are they during uh, certain parts of the year, because we sampled all year long. You can see that these are just a snippet of data, Sophora, Vaccinium, all the different plant types, when we surveyed throughout the year, and how many of uh, different taxa there are on those plant types throughout the year, because they're flowering at different times. You're getting different things all throughout the year. Do you have a rainy season? Did you have a drought that year? We have a drought year where we have really weird data. Um, that's what you need to know to be able to make decisions. So Heather, for her master's, really focused on uh, three plant types of Aoveo, uh, Hinahina and Mamane, as kind of the, the dominant shrubs in this area, the native shrubs. Um, they don't get very tall, maybe 15 feet or so in this area. Um, but we also looked at lots of other plants, but here's the fun pictures. So we were comparing, and we still haven't done the stats for this, but is it more efficient to run a transect or use Grant Garish's data and get randomly selected plants of all your different plant types, hike over the mountain to see if statistically you could just walk a line or you got to track everywhere and get your GPS unit and get to a specific plant. I mean, that's the details that you have to do. And all of this modeling was all informed by agricultural surveys for like wheat and aphids. It's a statistical model to make sure that you can get and have the confidence to know that you've made enough effort to catch the things that are there. It's a big mathematical model. And that's what we're gonna be looking at. Uh, good news, through all of that hiking for three years, no priority threats were detected. No social hymenoptera in colonies that were collected in there. Occasionally we'll see Vespula around the facility, um, no ants. That's amazing. That means they probably aren't there um, yet. <laughs> That's what we have to keep vigilant about to mitigate those potential problems. Here's the pictures, mamane trees. Here are the little insects that rely on that and there's our own ecosystem. We have plant sap feeding insects, the Opuna sharpianus, Orthotylus um, sophoricola. We have a socid, a bark louse that just eats the fungus that grows on the tree bark. Um, endemic taxa that is pretty prevalent, not really super specific to mamane, but regularly found there. This is a little Hylaeus bee, one of the endemic yellow-faced bees, hiding in the flower. Um, it was very cold that day, it was also raining. So there, you're hiding from the elements. Maybe that is the linchpin of this community, the ability to hide in a flower when it rains and snows. I don't know, but to get that information is necessary to see what these do in the environment. This right here, Nabis Kahavalu, this is the lion of this particular forest. It eats all of the little sucking bugs. Um, all of these creatures are then food for the birds. This is one of the only places where the amakihi, the endemic uh, insectivorous, nectivorous bird, has increasing populations. Is that because we have a stable resource of endemic taxa that it knows how to find through evolutionary connections? I don't know, but we do know that these are connected in one place that's a pretty good habitat, right to the north um, west of Haleopohaku. This plant, Kinopodium, um, Aveo veo smells like a fish, if you've ever seen this. It's also the same group that uh, quinoa seeds are from. Uh, you don't want to eat the Hawaiian quinoa. <laughs> it really doesn't taste good, it's quite toxic. Um, you wash it a few times, you'll probably not die. But these insects can eat it, and that's the only thing they eat. Um, they have evolved with this, especially this leafhopper right here, it's flightless. How is a leafhopper gonna get to a different plant? It's gonna hop but that means the plants have to be close enough together to disperse to get to a new plant. If you have one tree here, another over there, and the insects can't get there easily, and they're gonna die between, then that group can't move throughout the environment. You need to have a certain density of trees to have a good group of connected species. This is Nicias terrestris. It's related to the vacu bug. Um, the adults feed on the flowers and developing seeds. The immatures, the babies, live just on the soil, eating the seeds that have already fallen. Um, you'll almost never see the immatures up on the plant, but their life cycle is eating the dry seeds that are on the ground. 
and then they emerge as an adult and they'll fly between plants. Oh, sorry. This is a Plagithmysis, a longhorn beetle, and these, the larvae, live in the wood. They're a group that lives under the bark in the cambium, um, but they only attack already damaged branches. They don't kill trees. So if you're a wonderful endangered species of plant person and you want to save every piece of that endangered plant and you prune it and you make it leaf out and all that stuff, you're probably killing all of the insects that rely upon damaged branches to consume. Um, keep them connected. This is uh, the geranium, the hina hina. It's got its own leaf hopper, another flightless taxa. Basically, this group, the Nezosydney, um, everywhere else on Earth, they only eat grass. Only in Hawaii do they never eat grass. That's super weird. But the original ones that got here were probably flighted and ate grass and then became isolated, shifted to other host plants over a couple million years, and then moved to everything but grass because there are lots of other plants here. This is an endemic um, Hawaiian bee. That's the only endemic bee. Honeybees are not Hawaiian. Um, these are not social bees. They're solitary, and they're very small. This is a different plant, not part of Heather's um, specific thesis, but we did a lot of surveys on the other plants too. Again, another leafhopper, flightless. It's only on Pukiave, a great little taxa. If you want to indicate problems that might be related to your ecosystem, probably to look for something that's specific to another resource. If it goes away, it probably means there's something else wrong with your ecosystem, plus they can't fly. So they're pretty locked into where they are, unless you have a good corridor systems of connections of native plants. Yeah? Are these vestigial wings there? Uh, so th they're Micropterous or Brachypterous wings, but yes, those are the wings, but they're non-functional. Um, this is a Ectemnius wasp, which only eats flies. It's a predator wasp, solitary. It flies around and catches other, um, catches flies. Uh, not that wasp, no. Not the Ectemnius. Yeah, they're solitary. Um, most sphecids are non-social, um, uh, eusocial. Yeah. The endemic mintless mint, one of the groups, Stenogeny microphylla, has its own Nicias as well. And here's another Hylaeus bee with its little yellow face. Uh, if you can see, these are holes in the flower um, because honeybees can't fit into the corolla of the flower. So honeybees, they're the thieves. They'll cut through and eat the, get the nectar and not pollinate our native mints. Um, the Hylaeus bees are small enough to get in there. <clears throat> Dubaltias, they have their own fruit fly that only lives on the seed heads. And then another Nicias. These are more relatives of the vacu bug. And we can get these things regularly and reliably. And that's what the statistical models are for. If we want to see if it's still there, how much effort should we put in to make sure it's still there? When we know how many there are through years, then we can say, if we look 10 times and we don't find anything, likely they're not there right now. Maybe we have to wait for a season. Maybe they're in an egg stage. But if we always search 10 times and never find any, that's really indicating that they might not be there. Uh, Silver sword. Sorry, endangered, I never actually got to touch it, look for bugs on it. Um, but they do have their own fly as well that only lives in the flower heads. How often do silver swords flower? Every seven to 50 years, and then the plant dies. If you have an insect that only lives in the seeds of a flower, you gotta have lots of silver swords around constantly flowering to have a stable population of that fly. But they also use Dubalia which hybridizes with the silver swords and causes sterile silver swords. Ah, what are you gonna do? Do we keep these plants apart or we have enough, to have enough of them so that they're always around? Uh, and then grass. Yes, there are other caterpillars, cutworms that live down in the grass. Um, the Grotus melaninura was a taxa that uh, was listed as extinct. We find them all the time. They just are probably extinct from lower elevations because they got excluded from ants. But their entire Taxes probably moved uphill because it's also gotten much warmer in the past 20 years. Uh, this is one of our, this is actually the only new species I have ever found. We describe new species all the time, but other people have already found them. There's not enough entomologists to actually describe all these new things. This guy is new. Um, this is a new species of Pheogramma. It's one of the only flies that has stripes that goes this way instead of that way. That's the only reason why it was new. I, 
I'm not a dipterous guy. I don't know about flies. I just knew that looked really fun. Um, and then showed it to some other fly people and they're like, oh, that might be that weird one that Elmo Hardy saw one time on Saddle Road in 1953. He died in the insect museum where I got trained. Um, amazing dipterist, but he's no longer here. And this might have been one of the species that he had a note of in one manuscript that's unpublished that we found in the museum. It's amazing to see the history of the people involved in science. Uh, this was a new species that was just described, uh, genus uh, Philodoria. It's a leaf mining moth, really small, um, half the size of the width of your fingernail, uh, like basically two millimeters, really small moth. Here are the wings, part of the way that it was described by uh, Chris Johns, he's at Florida. And it was found on one plant um, on Mauna Kea, but we never found any larvae. It might have just been flown up there from lower elevation where its relatives are known from uh, feeding on alapa. So it might not even be endemic to this plant because we couldn't establish that relationship. It's just something that flew up there just like everything else does. But it was a new species. Now, when you have taxa that use endemic plants, what if you have invasive species that damage those plants? Aphids. No aphids are ever endemic to Hawaii. They're all introduced. Um, they're a problem. Ants love aphids. Who's a gardener? Who has ever seen an ant hanging out with aphids? Yeah, um, ants and aphids have co-evolved through those millions of years and ants farm aphids for the nectar from the plants because those aphids don't move anywhere. They cycle through sugar water really fast because they're trying to concentrate the proteins and fats that are in those vessels of the plants. But they squirt out essentially sucrose, sugar water. What I call in class, Jess, what do I call it? Sweet butt juice. Sweet butt juice. Uh, it, it's, it, they poop sugar. Um, manna from heaven in the Middle East. That was actually leaf hopper poop in a dry environment that were crystals falling out of trees. You collect sugar. That's manna. That's, those original stories were from leaf hoppers. They do the same thing. So if you have aphids on our native plants, the chance that if you get ants up there, that now they're going to have a ready food source. Darn it. If you don't have aphids, then maybe the ants won't have a source of sugar or water. So do you manage your aphid problem and then you'll be way less likely to get ants or do you ignore it? Um, that's a problem. We also looked at um, introduced plants and their insects that are associated with it. Um, lots of data about that and we're not gonna cover too much. So what do we find? Um, species of concern, like what should we be worried about? Um, this is kind of a value judgment. This is a management decision of what we should be concerned about. Is it something rarely encountered? Did we rarely encounter it because we don't know how to look for it? Um, or are they concerning because they can't move very far? So you have to have a good integrated ecosystem. So if you don't have a lot of those, um, I have this issue. We're doing outplanting of native plants all throughout Hawaii. Are we bringing the ecology with them? No. We have clean cultured stock of plants grown in greenhouses that are insect free because you can't move ants around either and you're not bringing the diversity back when you do your outplants, unless you're close enough to another forest for it to come naturally. Is that part of our management plans? No, it's not. Um, there are parcels that are restoration events, but not for the ecology of everything else. I think we're moving towards that, but it's not part of the state policy. Uh, this was a great creature, Micromus usingeri, a flightless lacewing, brown lacewing. Um, prior to when we found them, um, there were only no, eight ever in history. Then we put out a yellow jacket trap for one day to see if we might get non-target attraction. It got full of endemic moths and four of these exceedingly rare taxa in one day. It probably means that we weren't looking for them well and they probably live on the trunks of mamani trees and they're attracted to heptalbuterate, which all the other lacewings are attracted to. But you won't know that if you're a conservation scientist and you never look at the ag um, lures for biocontrol agents for aphids because that's what these do. They eat aphids and you can attract them to your area, uh, area with heptalbuterate because that's one of the pheromones they use to attract each other from eating. We just found a great way to monitor for this very rare thing. Had no idea we were gonna find that, but you never would have known that was cool if you were only looking for wasps. All right, here's the list. Uh, sorry, I'm not gonna read them all. Um, <laughs> We are almost done with our exhaustive taxonomy inventory of everything we've collected for the past five years. 
Um, it's over 250 species. This is 226 taxa that are identified, natives and non-natives. Um, it's, again, we are one of the only legal places to house these things here at UH Hilo. I wish we had an office where we could display these things. Maybe we'll get there. All right, here's the real science. Uh, so this is from Heather's project. Remember, just three species of plants over one year. We have five years worth of data in many other plants. So this is a very small snippet of her thesis. Lots of non-native things or things we couldn't determine whether or not they were native at that point in time. We've gotten much more taxonomic uh, resilience or um, resolution now, but lots of endemic hemiptera, and that might be a sampling bias. Why would we have so many well-identified hemiptera? Because I'm one of the only hemiptera specialists in the state. <laughs> Because that, that's the bias of how we can identify things quickly for this project. It might not be completely accurate, but that's the data we have for this group. What do we find on these three plant types? Abundance. So this is the number of specimens for um, mamane, aveo veo, hina hina, small shrubs. Almost nothing on those, not a lot. But the diversity we find on hina hina is almost equivalent. So there's not a lot of biomass, but the number of species is broadly equivalent to much, much larger shrubs. That's a really neat finding, and that's your basic ecology of diversity. We proved it on this little area on Mauna Kea from only 250 original migrants to Hawaii, and all of those theories were developed in Costa Rica where there's vastly more diversity than what we have in Hawaii. Oh goodness, what is this? Um, this is groupings of the ordinational space, basically the types of things, taxa with no real quality attached to it, on how specific they are to their host or how broad they are that they eat everything else. So are we only eating hina hina or are we eating hina hina, veo veo, and mamane? Because we catch the same taxa and over and over again. But what we do find is there are groups of taxa that only eat one plant and then there are groups of taxa that eat many other plants too, which means the non-natives of insects aren't picky. They'll be found on whatever plant because they're probably just trying to get a meal or a little bit of water to survive because they flew up there and they have no idea what they're doing because insects are stupid. Um, they fly uphill until they stop. Where is the biggest hill on this island? Top of Mauna Kea. Uh, insects, when they fly to disperse, want to get to the highest point to find a mate. Top of Mauna Kea. And then they die because there's no food. And then they feed everything else. Uh, this is a lot of the statistics of whether or not the amount of samples um, we conducted was enough to find all of the diversity in an area. And realistically, we didn't. So 35 samples on these plants for a master's thesis. If we did all the work, this should level out and go flat. Like, no more samples will get you more bugs because you already caught everything. So that's your efficiency metric. Um, 35 samples is not enough. When we looked at some other data, you get up to about 50 or 60. That's about right. And what the reality is, this is what is done in agriculture all the time for a decision of whether or not to treat for a pest. How many are there? Do I know it affects my yield? How often do I have to look to see how many there are, whether or not I should do something about it? You can do the same thing, and this is what I posit, this is not published yet, but this is what I want to get to. If we know that this is what the historic diversity or abundance was, and we want that to be our baseline, how much effort do we need to put into that to say confidently that it's the same that it was 10 years ago? And a lot of these plans are required to be retested every five years per that management plan. So we're constantly gathering the data to have a rolling diversity metric to see if the ecosystem is changing. That's already, that's what it's already doing. But we wanna be able to test it in a more definitive way. Um, it's tough to do, we need a lot more numbers. All right, invasive species. What do you look for? Ants. Um, in other places throughout Hawaii, whenever there are ants, you lose 50% of all your endemic diversity. They eat everything. Half of all of your insects and plants go the way, because they eat it all. That's the threat. How do you look for it? You look through all of the records, you talk to Fritz, you look at, talk to everybody, 
where are the threats likely to come from? From the support facilities here on campus? Sure, that's where a lot of vehicles go every day. If there are ants in our parking lots, are they the ants that are gonna survive up on Mauna Kea? Do we have any, any, any evidence that the ants here are the ones we find up there? How can we be confident in that decision? We look a heck of a lot to see if the taxa that we are finding here on vehicles, um, either from required to get washed every week or two or whatever, um, or a tourist who drives their vehicle up here. Here's one of my, here's one of my, my tourists. Um, we checked people's cars that regularly go off-roading to see what's on them. And we found people that don't wash their cars are full of invasive taxa. But the cars that are regularly washed and only drive to Mauna Kea where it's super dusty generally don't have as many invasive taxa. That's a great finding. It wasn't statistically significant, so I'm not even going to tell you, but we're close. It was, we only had about 10 samples of cars. It took a really long time to get those. Um, but it was very different. So we need about two more cars. <laughs> but here's all the ants we collected. The ones in blue are ones that have ever been found up on Mauna Kea. So in Hilo, lots of ants here on campus and up at the facilities. Some of these we have found on Mauna Kea occasionally. Um, none of them, except for one, Cardiocondyla kagutsuchi, are established. We've never found them more often than once, like one dead bug. What do you do if you find one dead bug in a trap? Well, what if a trap was sitting in my lab here on Hilo campus and we don't manage fire ants and there was a fire ant in my trap and it was in my lab and it was contaminated before I took it out? We, I found that once and I was like, crap. Now we have to seal everything in bags, put it in a Tupperware, put a pesticide, like a strip in there, like a no pest strip, so that all of my sampling gear won't be pre-contaminated. Those kind of details matter for this kind of work. So here are those ants, um, little fire ant, we all know this guy, but there's lots of diversity of ants around, but almost never do we find any at the top of Mauna Kea or lower. When you look at our elevational gradients, so this is the numbers of traps put out through a year um, and the ones that actually found ants. As you get higher elevation, this is the summit, um, you're not finding anything anymore. So huge amount of effort not finding ants. And that's on vehicles and right around the parking lots, the places where ants are going to fall out of vehicles or be established. Around garbage cans, like don't dump your trash. I don't care if it's organic, it's going to compost. You're feeding ants potentially. Put it in a trash can, bag it. <laughs> Those things really matter. Don't give food to ants anywhere. And that's what we found. There are no ants. Um, there are some spiders um, that are non-native that might be eating our native species. There's no management plan for spiders. And they're the same spiders that are everywhere. And spiders can fly. Did you know that? They put out their little silk and they balloon and they fall down everywhere. Um, they're everywhere. Same kind of thing. This is actually where we found a leveling off. So after about 300 samples, any more samples than that, you're just doing too much work. Um, so we did 600, but probably 300 was enough to say that there are not invasive species in this area. All right, the fun stuff. This is my attempt at Photoshop. Um, the summit. This is probably what a lot of you have come for. Uh, the vacu bug and the really interesting creatures at the top. This used to be a candidate endangered species. In 2011, it was not listed as endangered species because we found a lot of data to support that there's not enough evidence for that particular law to support that it's likely to be extinct without human intervention. That's really what the Endangered Species Act is. It doesn't matter if it's, well, it doesn't matter if it's cute. Yeah, you'll be much more likely to be endangered if you're cute. Um, Vicky bug, maybe not so cute. Um, these are the wings. They are micropterous. They do not fly. Um, in some literature, it's called wingless, but yeah, you know, it's just a very small wing. They only occur above 11,000 feet. They eat other insects. This is a tachinid fly. Uh, this is a happy family of vacu bugs sucking out its juices. Here's a vacu bug with its straw-like mouth parts sucking out the juice right between the suture between the compound eye and the gina. Actually, that's the fronds. Um, this is a tachinid fly. It's a parasite of uh, caterpillars, and it's a great pollinator. 
This is all pollen from its last meal. Um, actually better pollinator than honeybees. Anyway, it eats them. They get up there, there's no flowers to get nectar or water from, that fly will die and get consumed by a vacu bug. How do we catch them? We put in live pitfall traps. Vacu bugs eat anything that smells slightly rotting. Um, so we use tuna and shrimp paste. Uh, it smells pretty rotten after about three days out in the sun. And from one trap, we get anywhere from zero vacu bugs to a thousand in one trap at one time. We also get the endemic uh, wolf spider and the endemic caterpillar. And there's a vacu bug. There's some in the front uh, cabinets if you want to look at them after the talk. How do you catch them? You hike through the snow, you hike through the sun, you put out traps, you check them. Uh, we did have a fun event this summer. We got to film with BBC. So the next planet Earth will have vacu bugs and UH Hilo Lab. You can see this looks exactly like Mauna Kea. <laughs> uh, so the wolf spider. We're working with partners in France, Dr. Julien Petillon and his PhD student, Kaina Privé, um, to describe these. They're all described as Lycosa hawaiiensis, but whoever did them did it wrong. They're actually Hogna is not nearly as much fun name to say, but there are quite a few different taxa, and she's working on the genetics in that. So she'll be visiting in France to get a couple more to make sure that they have enough samples to determine if the summit Mauna Kea spider is different from the ones in Volcano or the ones on Saddle Road. And they are, because you might not know it, but we are looking at genitalia. There you go. Here's a boy, here's girls. <laughs> Noctuids. These are caterpillars that live down in the sand, down in the soil, consume anything. Um, grasses, lichens, dirt, dead bugs, they're not picky. Um, and then, this is known for general cutworms. They eat just about anything they run into underground. These are two new species, and this is just going to be published any, any second now. Um, it's accepted, the final revision, revisions were approved. Um, and this is one of those taxa we knew it was new since 1982, but no one ever described it. What specialist am I? I'm a hymiptera specialist, sucking bugs. I'm not a caterpillar specialist. So we had to make friends, work with Dr. Medeiros, find a real butterfly or a moth person to help us describe this taxa. So we had a great group of partners, uh, Matt, Jessica here, um, Christina Elliott, uh, Elliott from Manoa, Anderson Prestis from uh, Brazil, and then me and Dan. Dan and I. <laughs> and this is what we do as professors. We train people to make sure that we get good data. That is the point of all of this work. Um, again, you describe things in the insect world by the shape of their genitalia. You might not know, uh, but there you go. More genitalia. Here's mating vacu bugs. Uh, that's a girl, that's a boy. Uh, uh oh, I got it. <laughs> all right. So, this is work that I did way back for my PhD, so a long time ago. But nothing was really known about the vacu bug other than they're really cool. Uh, what we found was how they grow, how they reproduce, where they are, and genetically how distinct they are. So why the attention? It's amazing. Uh, it's a seed bug that doesn't eat seeds, it eats bugs. Uh, shift from predation of plants to predation of insects is quite a big jump. But not really when you think about a seed on the ground, and a fly on the ground and you're starving, what are you gonna do? Try to eat them. Um, and this is what that taxa does. And then now it's become specialized in that over a couple million, well, yeah, 200,000 years. Why is it getting the attention? Because it really is isolated to cinder cones where the telescopes are. That's gonna be a conflict. Whenever there's a 1.8 billion number tossed around with an environmental impact, there's always gonna be discussion. That's what we need to really focus on. What are the, reasons for any kind of problems with environmental assessments and how it relates to a pretty rare creature. Is it rare naturally? Is it rare because we've already ruined it? What do we do? And of course, because of these things, there's going to be laws that say you have to look at it. So that's what we did. We described the eggs, when they hatch, their life cycle, how they grow, the temperatures they need to grow, uh, Marlena, again, keep mentioning her. She's also my illustrator. Uh, she was also an art uh, minor, I believe. But this is the life cycle of the vacu bug, which you can see in Jessica's thesis. It's published in her thesis. 
Um, we also looked at the genetics of the bug. There is almost no genetic diversity in vacu bugs. The Kamehameha butterfly, you've heard of that one? 25 different genetic types in the same gene region. They're on Oahu on all the different islands. The vacu bug only has nine. Um, monk seals, I believe 40 different genotypes in those thousand monk seals left. Like a lot more genetic diversity than something like this. But insects are very different than vertebrates. What we found was that at the summit, a lot of the genetic diversity is found. Most of it is this one type um, in red, but in the lower elevation areas, almost all of the diversity is the most common, half the population of this genetic type. These are different populations because they don't interbreed regularly. That's a neat finding. That's only about uh, half a mile, but it doesn't fly and it's very small. So that's a big distance for a vacu bug. So there are different populations of the same species throughout this region. But with this gene, how does that happen? It's only maternally inherited. So really what probably happened, and the other weird thing is, the other species on Mauna Loa is very similar. It shares an entire genetic type, but the Mauna Loa ones are all one type. Probably because it's a volcano that keeps erupting and killing them all. And in removing an entire population. But we only looked in one place. But what does it probably mean? The summit is the source of founding events in these lower areas. And even if you get new migrants, because it's only maternally inherited, then if there's lots of the original genotype there, and then you get a little bit of more breeding in, it's, you're still going to lose that genetic signal. So it's not really definitive that these are isolated populations that are on their own evolutionary tract. It just means that the founding events swamp the genetic signal for this genetic type. If you want to talk genetics, talk later. <laughs> what really happened about last glaciation? These were covered with glaciers. The vacu bugs were in the snow area because they can survive it throughout Saddle Road. Glaciers melt. The bugs go where the weather conditions are ripe for killing their prey. Vacu bugs can't kill whatever they're eating. The environment has to do it for them. They don't have toxins. So they followed this cool area up to where it currently exists. That's why you can have a shared genetic type, but very different morphological types. They look completely different on the other, island, on the other mountain. But they're from a common ancestor only 15,000 years ago. And with this genetic type uh, that we looked at, it's, it, it doesn't mutate very quickly. So that's all we can tell. Rock substrates. These are rocks, they heat and cool in different uh, speeds. The surface can get very hot, and then it's very cold. Vacu bugs can only grow, because they're cold-blooded creatures, about eight hours of the day if it's sunny. Where is it sunny? And males live much longer. Um, I'm running out of time. <laughs> On Mauna Kea, because cinder cones are so tall, and the sun is in different planes during the winter and summer, right? Because it's on um, the northern side, what, during the winter, right? <laughs> but during June, on the northern slopes, there is vastly more heat available for those bugs to grow because there's more sun on that side. And then it switches in the winter. So the bugs will grow at different rates in different places. And that might be some of the artifacts of why our populations of vacu bugs appear to grow and crash all during the same times of the year when we look, it depends on how long the snow was there, whether or not it was a wet year, how much sunlight was on that particular cinder cone and how many bugs there were to begin with. And this is what Jessica did a lot of. Here's the annual monitoring, lots of vacu bugs one year, almost none 2014. If you recall, that's when Lake Wyal dried up almost, a drought year, really bad for bugs. Next year, start to rebound to almost the same level it was before. The breeding cycle, vastly different, even if it's during the exact same dates every year. It depends on what the season was. Was there late snow? Lots of immatures or lots of adults? Different years, different times, different cycles. Here's what happens during the winter. Vacu bugs on the north slope. Snows last longer in the north because the sun is on this side. Um, 
during the winter, which warms up this side of the mountain, and they can breed and reproduce if it's sunny during the winter. Every other time during the year, they're on the north side. Because vacu bugs are really dependent on the thermal input on cinder cones for their growth. This is Jessica's model of how likely and how many bugs you're likely to find on different areas of the cinder cone. Again, if we're way less likely to find vacu bugs and we're trying to establish how many there are in a place at the base of a cinder cone versus the top, we should not waste our time at the base of a cinder cone. They're more able to survive, reproduce, and be findable at the tops of cinder cones, which means we might be relegated to hiking cinder cones. I wish it was the opposite story. Um, but if you want your, academic, your data to be accurate and predictable, you probably want to go for where the vacu bugs are to see that they're always there. I'm almost done. So we worked with uh, geography, Ryan Peroy and Nathan Stevenson. Uh, he graduated, this, is, this paper is published, um, but collected a bunch of the data about cinder cones, rock substrate, slope, temperature, humidity, all of those things that make up the environment, and put in all of our cap capture data of where vacu bugs have been found throughout time, and got a model of where they're likely to be. So here's our predictive model of where vacu bugs are likely to be. The core population with the most genetic diversity is also the highest density and likely to be found. Whereas the fringe cinder cones, we have less of them. We did the same thing for spiders and caterpillars. They're vastly more common throughout the entire area and are not isolated to cinder cones nearly as much. So they're not as rare. Density is vastly lower. You might get 50 spiders where you get 5,000 vacu bugs, but you catch that many less often. Here's the, the wrap up. It's the people that matter. I would say all of this work on Mauna Kea, I started it in 2005 for my PhD. It's an amazing place and there's way more stories to tell. I can't tell them all. I shouldn't tell them all. Everyone else should tell them. So we have five new entomologists and a geographer who I made become an entomologist a little bit to understand this information from this unique place. We need more people to understand the complexity of all of these creatures that we share the earth with. How can we know how to protect them if we don't know what they are or how to look for them? Extreme fluctuations in the numbers of bugs through time and space is normal. You have to know what that means. It is definitely true that vacu bugs are the most habitat restricted creature up there. The other endemic taxa are everywhere. They're not as picky. They don't need that thermal environment as much as vacu bugs do. Or maybe the spiders eat them all in the glacial till. Spiders eat them. Maybe if there weren't spiders, vacu bugs would be everywhere. Um, I like the spiders though, they're about the size of your hand. Um, specific information. Yeah, there are a couple of unique taxa. We can probably find enough info to have really good guidelines that we already have in place to know what we're doing for these specific creatures. That should be used, but you cannot do that for every one of those 260 species especially if you only have five taxonomists or five workers that have been trained in that area. How many people work on the 40 species of birds that are left in the Big Island? Eh, about 60 to 100. How many entomologists? Three. Um, it's really tough to get enough data to really accurately follow trends in something so small. It's a challenge. I can't do this work alone. There are a billion people, many of which I still don't even have on this list because it got too long. I'm sorry, Sage. Did I see Sage? No, Joy. I don't even have you up here, Joy. But OMKM, essential. Um, funding for this, again, the observatories um, support time. I get to use an OMKM clean vehicle. <laughs> That's really important. Um, BISC, we've had lots of help. DOFA, um, all of this is done through a coordination of an advisory group that was formed whew, 2000, the year 2000, I think, right, right when OMKM was formed to begin with. So there's a group of about five to 10 scientists that always, I have to talk to everybody about the work up there to make sure it's gonna be the highest quality we can do. Um, I'm gonna leave this up here. Fritz introduced me too long, so I'm exactly one hour. <laughs> if there are any questions, please ask, and there are insects up here that we can look at for a few minutes after we're done. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
we do have a question. Interested in your um, analysis of theory, some insects that are less polite oh. change and came back. How do you know this? Yeah, so, so that Drosophila genetics story was uh, conducted through a lot of researchers at UC Berkeley. Um, I forget the lead author's name right now. Jess, do you remember, does anybody remember the Drosophila taxonomist? Uh, O'Grady, Peter O'Grady. So Peter O'Grady did all of his work on some of these endemic Drosophila flies. And that is looking at, it's because Drosophila melanogaster, that fly, is like the model organism for all genetics. They know that group and they know the entire gene, the genome of the entire group, and they know how quickly the mutations occur in all of these different lineages to put a really firm date on when these groups evolved and who their ancestors were. So it, it's super detailed. I can give you, like, give me a card or whatever, but it's um, uh, Patrick O'Grady. Dr. O'Grady is the one who did it. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, I worked with Peacock before yeah. on the plant side, and I know that they were arguing. California on where the fruit flies come into California, yes. whether they were coming from Hawaii yep. or from Mexico. And, and we're still doing that. There's, there's, the arguments are the same. Exactly. Now we're doing it for the light brown apple moth and everything else. But the genetics of that and that process of, I mean, this is so much older genetic um, groupings that's not related to that particular issue because they're looking at the entire genome in an evolutionary sense, not just whether or not it's from the source population here in Hawaii or from Mexico. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an amazing story, but it's, it's hugely, I mean, there's been hundreds of papers about these things. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, Corey. Yes. Yeah. So trophic levels is the transfer of energy from a uh, plant to who's eating the plant to who's a carnivore, basically primary producer and herbivore, a carnivore is your classic trophic pyramid of getting energy from whatever you're consuming. So vacu, not vacu bugs, no, they, they are, but uh, bugs in general as trophic mediators, they mediate the energy transfer between all those levels because you can have an outbreak of insects that kills all the plants. Um, the plants will grow back if they were seeding or whatever, but Insects are one of those linchpins because everything else eats them because they are the majority of all taxa that consumes almost all of primary producers of plants throughout the world. So insects eat the plants and everything else eats them, essentially. So they are the mediators that help regulate the amount of energy that moves throughout your ecosystem. That's what I was trying to say, if that helps you. Or we can talk later. <laughs> if there's fewer insects, then there's probably going to be more plants. Think of Albizia, right? Those giant trees. If there's no insects eating giant trees, then they're going to stay there because insects are by and large the things through moving diseases, through their own consumption of regulating how much other creatures can grow because they're vectors of diseases. They, they, they move all of the things that regulate growth of everything else through an environment. So if you think of it like Albizia trees, if we bring in a biocontrol that's very specific to that and slows the growth, you don't have to kill them, but maybe the branches will stop falling during a storm. Um, just slow it down so they're not as fragile. And that's what insects can do through their sheer density of numbers and specific connections to specific plants. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the theory of that. Maybe one more. Or we eat cookies and look at bugs. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. There's way too bugs you were talking mm -hmm. about how they drop off so much in the coal. How are they coming back in there? Are they dispersing into it? Or so the problems are the way we find vacu bugs is by an attractant trap, right? So they have to be hungry and warm enough to walk. So we, we don't know what the actual densities are if they're not findable in our traps because we can only use live traps. Otherwise, you're going to lift up every rock and look in every puka to try to figure out where they all are. So it might not be that there aren't any during winter. It's just that they're hibernating. They're estivating. 
Um, they're just in their physiology. Perhaps they're hiding down in that substrate later that always stays cold because there's not enough food around and they just stay hidden until the environmental conditions trigger them to feed again. So that, that's a lot of the issues with understanding how sampling works. And that's why, I mean, I've been classically trained in pest management was my actual original entomology thing. And that's all I do is I use pest management for conservation. It's the same theory, but there are very special conditions like how accurate is my survey method going to be for this problem. And it's really hard to explain to people that maybe there aren't years where there aren't any vacu bugs or places, but they're not findable while you were there. And how do you put that in the report every time? Uh, it was a cold week. We need the evidence to say why that is true. And that's what Jessica did. <laughs> so th that's kind of the answer I can give you is there might not be only a few of them, but we also know that when they're breeding, their population, because they're bugs, their population doubles every 15 days. So if you have 20 and you have three months, ta-da, you've got a couple thousand to that area. And we've also looked at like how much bug fall, their food falls out of the sky. It's a huge amount. If you've ever been at the summit of Mauna Kea, some weeks you're just completely covered with those stable flies from, from the ranch, from Parker Ranch, when they call their cattle. All the flies go to try to find more mammals to eat and they fly up. They don't find anything other than humans. And then they'll suck some human blood that they don't really like it, and then they die because they've run out of energy. And that's what the vacu bug eats. I, I just really don't think that the food that falls out of the sky up there limits the number of vacu bugs. because There's so much dead stuff up there um, at almost all time. Um, so that was a little bit of a tangent. With that, thanks again, Justin. All right, thanks for having me. I love telling these stories.